The majority of the 19th century was marked by the Victorian era, which coincided with the reign of Queen Victoria of Great Britain. It should come as no surprise that death and mourning were subject to a stringent set of social conventions throughout the Victorian era, which isn't exactly famed for its laissez-faire approach toward social custom. Extensive mourning customs became the standard at this time, to the point where people who didn't adhere to these rigidly prescribed mourning customs faced social stigma. Some of these customs, such as eating dinner after funerals and placing flowers around the corpse of the deceased, remain in use today, while others, some of them really strange, faded away with the passing of time. Here are some of the strange funeral traditions in the Victorian era. The Victorians were not hesitant to commemorate the dead in ways that, by today's standards, might be a touch unusual. During the Victorian era, remembering the dead was so common that pieces of the deceased's hair were snipped off and made into brooches, lockets, and wreaths. A family may send the hair to an artist who would make the items for them if they weren't too crafty or were too depressed to make them themselves. In the end, human hair brooches aren't all that unusual, especially in light of the fact that this was a society that opened mummies for amusement, conducted public visits to the mortuary, and manufactured fans out of taxidermied birds and cats. Obituaries and death notices were printed in newspapers throughout the Victorian era, just like they are now. The Victorians, however, didn't stop there. Invitations to funerals were occasionally sent to close friends and relatives. This was typically done when persons close to the deceased lived elsewhere and were unaware of the newspaper notification. The invites were enclosed in matching envelopes and written on stationery with a black border. Because the typical stamps were printed in cheerful colors, some people petitioned the U.S. Postal Service to make a special mourning stamp for these uses. There were three separate stages of mourning for the morally upright and respectable Victorian widow, and each one had to be followed before a widow could go on with her life. The first, known as deep mourning, mandated that a widow don a black garment and veil, sometimes referred to as widow's weeds, for a year and a day following her husband's passing. The subsequent stage, known as second mourning, lasted in another 9 to 12 months. She was allowed to remove the veil during this time, although she was still required to dress mostly black. Half grieving, the third and final stage, lasted 6 months. Women could wear bright attire with black embellishments during this time of grief, but nothing too garish. Since photography wasn't invented until the middle of the 1800s, it was still rather expensive during the Victorian era. Many times, people did not have the means to purchase joyful family photos like they can today. Therefore, you had to take advantage of photo opportunities by capturing something that was actually important in your life for posterity. Saving a photo opportunity to snap a picture with a loved one who has passed away to eternally remember them was one way to make the most of it. Family members would raise the money after a loved one passed away to have a photo shot with them. Frequently, this was the only image they had of their now broken family. A formal lunch or meal would be provided to the mourners following the funeral. A special funeral biscuit or cookie was provided to those who couldn't make it to the feast. These seasoned, buttery nibbles were tied shut with a black ribbon and wrapped in paper with gloomy poems, facts about the deceased, Bible quotes, or prayers. Like modern prayer cards, the paper was meant to be preserved as a burial remembrance. One of the strangest Victorian funeral traditions entailed drapering black crepe cloth over all the mirrors, portraits, and shining things, like vases, in the home. For a variety of reasons, this posthumous procedure was necessary. One, because shiny objects, in all their unsuitable shininess, were an affront to the family in grief, covering all shiny objects with black fabric essentially plunged the house into mourning. Additionally, the Victorians thought that the deceased may manifest in mirrors, become trapped there, and summon other family members to accompany them into the afterlife. Therefore, hiding them was a rather necessary precaution to avoid that scenario. One of the more extravagant Victorian mourning customs is the use of tear vials. As their name implies, they are actually little glass vials with rubber or cork stoppers that are used to collect tears shed by mourners during funeral rites. Mourners would hold the vials up to their faces throughout the wake and funeral to catch their tears. These vials would be given to the family of the deceased after the service as a way to demonstrate how much the deceased would be missed. Tear vials were also very helpful in assisting a grieving family in determining the length of the suitable mourning period. Once all of the tears in the vials had dried up, mourning could end. Fortunately, 
There were specifically written mourning manuals that would define all the regulations for those meticulous and devout Victorian mourners, so they didn't have to memorize them. The emergence of companies focused on mourning traditions was one of the many impacts of the Industrial Revolution on Victorian society. As part of this, books containing instructions on how to mourn properly were created and distributed. These volumes included chapters on behavior, manners, eating, and clothes, among other topics. A widower might remarry at any point while they were still in mourning, unlike widows. He would choose a new wife if he had young children and no older ladies in the family to take care of them. The widower, groom was exempt from donning his black suit and hat mourning attire on his wedding day. He was forced to put them on the very following day, and his new wife was forced to observe the normal period of mourning as well. The corpse could not be taken from the home head first, whether he was en route to the funeral home for embalming or to the church for the funeral service. Instead, the corpse had to go in with feet first. In the Victorian era, it was thought that if the dead were taken head first, they would take advantage of the situation to beckon to family members and demand that one of them follow them in death. Although there were funeral homes in the Victorian era, they mostly served as embalming facilities rather than the all-you-can-death service parlors that are present today. They had not yet been used for services. Instead, the body of the deceased was placed in a coffin, which was then on display in the parlor of the residence. Friends, neighbors, and family members would come to say goodbye and console bereaved family members, and some number of people would remain with the body, keeping watch, round the clock, until it was interred. Embalming had been practiced for centuries, take the example of ancient Egyptian mummification, but by the Victorian era, fully efficient, contemporary embalming still hadn't been developed. Arsenic was still being used as a preservative at that time, in fact. So fresh flowers were always needed around the body to cover the foul smell of a body decaying in the living room of its previous home. Since there were no air conditioners available at the time, a summer wake required the fragrant service that flowers provide. Flowers no longer fulfill the dual role of the Victorian era, yet still being connected with funerals as a sign of respect. Victorian conventions required that someone sit next to the deceased person's body for the duration of the time it was displayed in the home. There are a variety of explanations for this, one of which is the notion that it eased the dead's journey to the afterlife. The necessity to keep rats away from the body, to remain nearby in case the deceased wasn't quite dead, and to greet anyone who traveled a long distance to pay their respects and arrived at an odd hour were more useful justifications for this constant vigil. Morning rituals weren't just for adults to follow. Children had to wear morning clothing and follow a certain set of behaviors, as well. If the child was under the age of 12, he or she could wear regular clothing but had to include a black, during the winter months, or gray, during the spring and summer, armband and matching clothing accents. Children over the age of 12 wore standard morning clothing that was the same as the adults. Don't forget to like this video and to subscribe to this channel, remember to hit the bell button for easy notifications.